Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 2nd to the 8th of December. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by astronomer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. It's great to be back. Yes. So what do we have to look forward to in December? Well, lots of long, dark nights. So there's plenty to see this week. So coming up this week, we've got five planets visible at the same time in the evening sky. Jupiter reaches opposition this week. Mars is visiting a beehive. And we've got some lovely lunar sunrises, a meteor shower and a colourful geometric shape. So lots to see this week. (laughs) That's that's lots of interesting sounding things. I'm intrigued to find out what we've got in store. So please do tell us more. Well, first of all, Venus will be the first planet that becomes visible in the evening sky. It's currently in Sagittarius, so it's quite low in the sky, but it's blazing in the southwest at mag minus 4.2. Sets at 7 p.m. On Wednesday the 4th, Venus will actually lie just four and a half degrees above the crescent moon and the moon is going to set at about 6.20 that night. So look for that. That'll be a beautiful pairing. And then the following night, Thursday the 5th, you'll have Venus about nine degrees to the right of the crescent moon, be a slightly thicker crescent moon the following day. So that was just the moon and a planet together are always just so beautiful, especially when it's Venus. So they make a great photo opportunity. Also, as soon as it gets dark, if you look towards Aquarius, which is about 29 degrees above the south, you will find Saturn. Saturn is easy to see, but it's only at mag plus one. And it's a good time to remind listeners that may not know that the magnitude scale is logarithmic. So although Venus being mag minus four and Saturn being mag plus one, that's not a linear scale. So Saturn is actually 100 times fainter than Venus is. But that said, it is still very easy to see. It's setting at about 11.30. And there are a couple of interesting events happening with Saturn this week as well. So on Friday the 6th, Titan's shadow is going to transit the disk of Saturn. So if you've got a big telescope, that's something to look for. And then on the 7th, on Saturday the 7th, Saturn is just about 7.3 degrees above the crescent moon. The night after, it's going to be below the first quarter moon. So another bunch of moon and planet pairings there for, for Saturn. So that will be really beautiful to look at both of those planets. And remember, if you have a small telescope, you will spot the rings of Saturn, but they are quite hard to see at the moment because we're viewing them kind of edge on. So they're not as easy to see. We're heading towards a plane crossing in about March next year. But I think that you said this is a good opportunity to sort of remind yourself of just how bright various magnitudes are relating to each other, because that's that's a big difference between Saturn and Venus at at the time. Even though they're both still relatively bright, you can see see a massive difference. Yeah, I I mean, it it really is. I used to watch a lot of Iridium flares and just that helped me get a handle on how bright things actually are. When some of those flared at mag minus eight, it was like, well, it's as bright as the moon nearly, you know, it's just absolutely (laughs) incredible. And then another one that was just mag plus one, still great, but so different. And it's really good to kind of have that in mind. And with magnitudes in mind, Neptune is actually just 14 degrees to the left of Saturn this week on the border between Aquarius and Pisces. But that is mag plus 7.8. So you're definitely going to need optical aids to see it. It's setting at about quarter to one in the morning. Uranus also very faint. That lies between the boundary between Aries and Taurus, and that is about seven degrees to the right of the Pleiades. So you can use the Pleiades as a way to try to locate Uranus if you've never seen it before. Mag plus 5.7, again, you're going to need binoculars to do that, but binoculars, small telescope, certainly good enough to spot that. And it's going to be visible most of the night. It doesn't set until six o'clock in the morning, so there's plenty of opportunity there. Jupiter is shining over in the east after dark and that is mag minus 2.8 so that is 
looking absolutely gorgeous. And on the third, you'll have Io's shadow transiting Jupiter at 8.30 p.m. The interesting thing about the shadow transits this month are that normally when you see a shadow transit on Jupiter, there's quite a gap between where the moon itself is and where the shadow is. This month, they are pretty much side by side. They're really, really close together. And that's purely down to the angle that we're viewing it at. So, yeah, you will actually, if you've got a big telescope, you'll actually see Io itself as well as the shadow. They're like a little snowman alongside each other. It's basically, it's like, are you staring like straight at it? Or are we looking at it from a slight angle? Because if you're looking at it from an angle, then, you know, it's like with normal shadows, it stretches off into the distance. Whereas in this one, it's just a little bit to the left or to the right. Yeah, and all of the shadow transits this month are actually on Jupiter anyway. They're all kind of the moon and the shadow are quite close together. So that's a really good time to see if your telescope is capable of actually seeing the moon as well as the shadow. On Friday the 6th of December, Jupiter is actually at its closest to Earth, this apparition. Its distance varies. It's going to be 612 million kilometres on Friday the 6th, but back in May it was 750 million kilometres away. But it, its distance can vary anywhere between 588 and 968 million kilometres. That's because Jupiter's orbit isn't perfectly circular and Earth is moving in its orbit as well. So the distance between the two can vary massively. But we are at the closest on the 6th, but Thursday the 7th is when Jupiter reaches opposition. As we always say, though, you don't just have to observe it on that night. When a planet is at opposition, it's good to view all month long. It's there all night from sunset till sunrise. And that is definitely a really good time to observe the outer planets. Mars this week lies in Cancer. It's rising over in the northeast at about 10 to 8 in the evening, a little bit after Venus has set. That will then be visible all night long. It's currently at mag minus 0.5, but it is going to continue to get brighter all month. On Monday, the 2nd of December, Mars is going to lie close to M44, the Beehive Cluster. It's just one of my very, very favourite clusters, so it's always good to have something nearby to take a photograph of. And another interesting event on Monday the 2nd is that Mars is actually going to occult a star. It's only a mag plus nine star, so it's very, very faint, so it will be hard to capture unless you have a big telescope. But that is just such a great demonstration of the fact that the planets are moving at a different speed to the stars because Mars is just going to slowly nudge, hide the star, and then a couple of hours later the star will pop back out again. And it's not very often that these happen. They're not infrequent, but to actually have two in a month, which is what we get in this month, it's really quite cool. And if you've got a decent sized telescope, you should be able to observe that. Also with Mars on the 6th of December, Mars is changing from prograde to retrograde motion. So it will appear to move westwards day by day against the background stars. This is totally normal part of Mars's orbit, the way that the two an inner planet and an outer planet kind of play this game of cat and mouse. It's not actually stopping and changing direction. It's just the way that we're viewing it is changing. It's just to do with the different speeds that Earth and Mars are going around the sun, the fact that we've got Mars has got a longer orbit than Earth it basically means that sometimes Mars appears to move in one direction and appears to move in the other but it's actually it's just our relative speeds to each other as we're, we're sort of going past yeah, that, that's what those terms mean. And if you see them in the horoscopes, that, that's what those terms mean. It's not actually stopping and changing direction. It'll have no impact on your daily life whatsoever. If you are tracking it across the night sky, that's where it appears to go backwards. It's movement across the night sky. It's movement around the sun it has been the same direction for the last 4.5 billion years, as far as we know. Yeah, it's a good one to actually sketch. If you draw a constellation of where the planet is and then just every couple of days, just mark where the planet actually is relative to that constellation, you will be able to do the drawings and actually see it swing around from prograde to retrograde. So it's quite a good, fun drawing project to do. There's quite a few fun photographs as well where it's the same foreground every single time but you can see the mars or the moon or some people even do it with the sun as well over the course of a year showing how its movement changes across the year yes i'm going to talk about that in a couple of weeks actually <laughs> Ooh, well we look forward to it and i'm sure our, our listeners will be back 
So moving on to the moon, this week we're moving from a new moon into first quarter. On the 8th of December, we can see the sun rising over Montes Apenninus, one of the mountain ranges named after the Pennines here on Earth. And also in the similar area to that is Crater Archimedes, which is one of my very favourite craters. And it's always great to see the sun rising over those areas and get those beautiful dark crater shadows. At 5pm on Sunday the 8th, the shadows from the sun rising over the southern peaks of Montes Caucasus create that strange clair obscure effect that I spoke about earlier in the year where the shadows cast by the mountains and then there's a little peak that makes an eye and it forms, the shadow is the side profile of a face, the peak gives you a little eye and then the ragged mountains look like hair and I firmly believe it looks like Barry Manilow. I have talked about oh, him before. Oh, is Barry back? Barry oh, is back. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can see that on Sunday the 8th from around about 5pm. So that's a good one to look for. Moving on to Comet C2023A3, Tsutsun Shan Atlas. It is now a telescope object and if it continues its predicted path, it's going to go somewhere from around mag plus 9 to plus 10.5. So it is going to be more difficult to see than it was, but it's kind of located within the Milky Way at the moment. So it does look really beautiful on photographs. It's going to be possible to catch it with a telescope, but from Wednesday this week, the moonlight is going to strongly interfere with that so it's better to try and have a look at the beginning of the week once the crescent moon is set but before the comet sets which is at about quarter to nine in the evening it's going to be trickier to catch than it has been over recent times but it's still worth looking out for i think that is also important to point out that just because people always pay attention to comets when they're at their peak of activity and they're closest to earth and they're biggest and brightest and they have these big tails but they're still beautiful the rest of the time and they're still, you know, it's passing through the Milky Way. It's like, how often do you get to, to image a, a really nice comet going through the Milky Way? We'll never see this comet again. Yeah, exactly. It's, there's a bit of a controversy about just exactly how long its orbit is. There's a lot of people reporting that it's 80,000 years its orbit and it's actually more like several million and it might not even ever come back because it's probably going to get nicked by another star. So it's a really interesting comet. It's our only opportunity that we're ever going to get to see it, at least in our lifetimes. So... Yeah, it's like that with so many comets. They're always worth observing, even when they're not at their best, like you say. And they sometimes can have outbursts and surprise you, so you just never know. Yeah, exactly. The Geminids meteor shower begins on the 4th of December. It's active from the 4th to the 20th. And this is an interesting shower because most meteor showers are caused by debris left behind by a comet. But the Geminids is actually an asteroid. It's an Apollo-class asteroid, 3200 Phaethon. And it's thought to be part of a new class of asteroids. The boundary between a comet and an active asteroid is very, very blurred. We don't fully understand all of these subcategories and how things behave. So a rock comet is some way that people do describe this. It's dead now, but at one time it was very active and left behind this repeated line of debris, which is why we have the meteor shower. So it was obviously active a long time ago. The debris stream is very spaced out, which is why it's active for a few weeks once the moon is out of the way you might spot some early ones as we head towards the peak we are going to have a lot of moonlight interfering but it's always worth having a look for those they move fairly quickly but you can get them punching through a bit of moonlight so do keep an eye out for that and finally the pisces parallelogram this is an asterism of stars that has a really beautiful colour contrast within the stars. I do love a good colour contrast, double star or a little asterism that has colour contrast. This asterism lies halfway between the circlet in Pisces and the star Deneb Ketos Shemali. So the northeastern corner of this parallelogram is a really bright blue white star. That's 29 Piscium. And diagonally across from that is another star, 30 Piscium, and this one is really orange, a sort of reddish orange colour and more muted. So the, there's a really a very apparent colour difference between those two stars. If you look at this area of the sky with low magnification, you will see that the upper part of the parallelogram looks like a completely empty patch of sky. 
But with very dark skies and a bit more magnification, you'll find that it's actually full of faint stars. So it's just that kind of limit of the resolution of lower magnification. Looks like a piece of empty sky, when in reality, there's probably no patch of sky anywhere that is actually empty if you look at it with a powerful enough telescope. And so it's probably best to view this between the 2nd and the 5th of December after the moon has set so that you've got a nice dark sky to look for those colours. Thank you very much, Mary, for taking us through all of that. It certainly sounds like there's lots of really interesting things to see in the sky this week. And if our listeners want to get even more stargazing highlights, please subscribe to the podcast and we will be back next week with even more. But to summarise this week again, six planets are going to be visible every evening this week while the moon is moving from new to first quarter. On Monday, the 2nd of December, Mars is going to be near the Beehive Cluster and will even occult a star, while Comet A3 is moving through Aquila. On Tuesday 3rd, look for the colour contrast stars in the Pisces parallelogram, as well as the Moon, Io and a shadow transit across Jupiter. On Wednesday the 4th, Venus is going to be above a crescent moon, whilst the Geminids meteor shower is set to begin. Then on Thursday the 5th, Venus will be back again to the right of the crescent moon this time. On Friday the 6th, Jupiter is at its closest to Earth this apparition as Mars moves from prograde to retrograde. Then on Saturday the 7th, Jupiter reaches opposition, Saturn is above the crescent moon, and finally, finishing off the week on Sunday the 8th, Saturn is below the first quarter moon whilst the Sun rises over Luna Montes Apennius and the crater Archimedes. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you all here next week. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our Sky Guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts, or head to Spotify, iTunes, or your favourite podcast player. 